What up, nerds? My name is Leslie Smith. Welcome to The Nerdy Narrative, a channel where we talk about science fiction, fantasy, and horror-related bookish things. If you're already a subscriber, welcome back. Thank you for visiting today. If you're new and you like what you see, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your way out today. Also recently started a Discord server, so if you would like to come by and chat with me there along with some of the other Nerdy Narrative family, please do so. I'll put an invite link in the description box below. It is new. I'm still working on getting everything set up how I want it. I'm going to try and have channels for books that I'm reading if you want to read along or if it's one you've read and it's a favorite of yours and you want to see what I think as I go through. That'll be there. I just figured that would be easier for us to have actual conversations rather than trying to do it in the comments on a YouTube video. Today we're going to talk about Peace Talks, the long-awaited 16th book in the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. If you've been around a while, you know that I have been counting down the months, weeks, days, hours for this release, and I was not disappointed. It is absolutely one of my favorite books of the series. I don't know if it's because it's been so long since we've had an installment in the series or if it truly is one of my absolute favorites. There were a lot of characters missing out of this one that I imagine we'll see in Battleground because originally Peace Talks and Battleground was one book but the publisher told Jim, look man this book is so big the price we'll have to charge for it, nobody's gonna buy it and it's like bro where's the logic in that? If we're gonna buy two books for 20 bucks a piece, why wouldn't we buy one book for 40 bucks a piece? So that just didn't track with me, but that could just be me. At least we're getting both within a couple months time. And that's great because where they chose to split it, I, I didn't feel it was, I felt it was kind of abrupt where they split it, but I guess it was probably the best place that they could. But where they did choose to split it, if Battlegrounds wasn't a couple of months away, I would be very upset. Okay, so at this point, if you have not read Peace Talks, you need to click off, save it in your watch later videos, come back when you've caught up. But if you're reading this series or you're planning to read this series, you need to go bye bye for now because I'm about to be dropping spoilers left and right discussing this book. Let's just jump into this because I am dying to get this all out. So the first thing, I have been doing a slow reread of the Dresden Files with a group on Twitter. We're currently reading Death Mask this month. When I started my reread, I also had recently gotten into audiobooks and I had always heard that the best format to experience the Dresden Files were the audiobooks narrated by James Marsters. I have to agree, I really enjoy what Marsters is able to do with his narrations. It's more like acting than just reading a book to me. Plus his voice is all growly and sexy. So. But I've listened to so many now that when I read Peace Talks, I could just I heard it in James Marsher's voice, if that makes sense. It's old news. The book opens up in chapter one with Thomas dropping the bomb on Harry that Justine is pregnant. Evidently, it is something that can happen with the vampires, although it is very rare. Justine and the child have a 50-50 chance of actually surviving it because being a white court vampire, the child is going to be feeding off Justine during the whole pregnancy. So that's going to be a really dicey situation. And Thomas is really upset by it. I also think he's, while he's upset about the health of Justine and the child making it, I think he's also not too sure about being a dad. A couple of chapters later, Harry and Thomas come home from their morning run and they hear voices in the kitchen and it's Maggie and Bania. They are, Maggie's making pancakes and Bania has supplied her with a plethora of recipes and Maggie has chosen number seven, so they're talking it through. A, a couple things to note here. So I loved seeing how Maggie and Bania interacted with each other and basically are learning from one another. But the way that Harry talks to the two, I don't think Harry feels the same about Bania, who is just as much his child as Maggie is. 
you know, Maggie is a flesh and blood, blood child born of, of the love between he and Susan, while Benio is a spirit of intellect born between he and Lash's connection while he had her coin. I was so excited to see about Benio in this book, but I really I'm not excited about how Harry seems to feel about her. That was basically it. We, there was no more interaction with her for the rest of the book. So I was disappointed. I'm hoping that there's more in Battleground. Actually, I'm hoping that there's a lot more in Battleground. Like we had no dealings with Bob the Skull, which was disappointing. Mac was mentioned, no visits to the pub for any beer yet. And the Alphas, they were absent. I guess the reason for that is because the original book was split into two, so I'm guessing maybe the rest of the game comes into play in Battleground as they gear up to fight the Formor and the Titan. So we have that touching scene, which is kind of spoiled by Ebenezer McCoy showing up to Harry's apartment. Ebenezer is a little on edge and there could be a lot of reasons for that. Mostly he's set off because Thomas is there and he is a white court vampire. We all know how much Ebenezer hates the white court vampires and I've just really been wanting him to know that Thomas is his grandson. But I didn't really stop to think about how that could turn out. Because Ebenezer hates the white court vampires, I think finding out Thomas is his grandson is going to make him even more pissed because I don't think he's ever going to think his daughter actually loved Thomas. I think in Ebenezer's mind, she was taken against her will, used by Thomas's father. And that's a great point because Margaret carried a white court vampire child, Thomas. I wonder if Harry and Thomas's mother was able to carry Thomas to term because she was a wizard. You know, they're all worried about Justine saying she's got a 50-50 chance of carrying the, the child to term because he's a vampire and the child's hunger is going to be feeding off her. I thought white court vampires were actually human until a certain age when they could be turned by the hunger before they could experience true love. Hmm. So Ebenezer comes in, they have, he and Thomas have a little bit of a stilted conversation. Thomas just decides he needs to exit stage left and get out of there. Harry learns that the White Council is going to have a vote about booting his butt from being a wizard of the White Council. That is a problem because if Harry is stripped from that little bit of a weak protection that the White Council provides, that's really going to only leave him with being the Winter Knight, which is seen as an enemy by more people than not. I'm not surprised to see that coming because in addition to the Black Council wizards wanting Harry gone, I think that most of the White Council ones do as well. So it's hard to say, well, this is a Black Council plot to get rid of Harry and maybe fracture the White Council because they know the gatekeeper and Martha Liberty listens to Wynn and Ebenezer support Harry. The Black Council is like, you know what? If we can get rid of Harry, maybe those four will split from the Council and just break the White Council all together and get rid of it. But the White Council members that aren't Black Council don't see it coming because they want Harry gone for other reasons. We skip forward a little bit. Ebenezer and Harry are together again. The outsiders are coming into the our plane of existence called by a mortal. Ebenezer and Harry are trying to get to a location that is not that doesn't have a whole lot of human population to try and fight these guys. As Harry has said many times in the past 15 books, he says stars and stones. And for some reason, for the first time in 15 books, Ebenezer says, don't say that. You don't even know what it means. Bro, like where have you been for the past 15 books? If he's not saying hell's bells, he's saying stars and stones. Well, then Ebenezer drops a little bit of a nugget about Harry being starborn. That evidently this happens once every 666 years. A child is born in starlight. I mean, there's really not enough to grasp onto here, but Harry is starborn. Evidently, starborn children are able to hurt the outsiders. While they're able to cause them pain, they're able to banish them and not be mentally incapacitated. 
kind of like Nemesis, never was actually able to get into Harry. So he worked on Harry's friends instead. But I mean, I just, I just have to wonder if the Stars and Stones thing was something that Butcher just decided, oh, let me throw this in because it's going to be something related to the starborn deal and i'm gonna throw this in i don't know i kind of feel like that maybe that was an afterthought like didn't really think that through oh i let him say it for 15 books ebenezer never corrected him or any of the other council members who probably know what that phrase actually means i mean kind of like conjuritis was thrown in while conjuritis was absolutely hysterical i love that i chuckled every time it feels like an afterthought. Why was that thrown in? I mean, was it put there for just comedic relief? Or does it have another purpose? But it's also, everybody else seemed to always know about it and that it's something child wizards experience, not older wizards. And that confuses me because children aren't wizards. They don't really start manifesting powers until they're teens. So it's like, do they mean young as in like centuries or what does that mean exactly? Like what was the play there? Harry's still living with Molly in the Sport Alf building. And I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but that's how it goes. And I really enjoy getting to learn more about the Sword Isles. The way that they're written in this book and how they interact with Harry, it reminded me of Eugene from The Walking Dead. They're just kind of quite, they're quite, literal and just kind of, you know, deadpan delivery. I really enjoyed learning more about them. They seem to be pretty freaking powerful little beings that nobody wants to mess with. When I'm reading about it, I'm like, wow, okay, he is literally going to be in the best protected place. Okay, well then all of a freaking sudden, we find out Thomas has broken in and tried to kill Itri, who is like the head sword off in charge. But it's like, okay, well, Thomas is no slouch himself. If he wanted to kill somebody, he should have killed him. So the, the consensus in the book is somebody threatened Justine to get Thomas to kill Eitri. But I think Thomas, for appearances, wanted to make it look like he was trying to do what he was supposed to do by killing him, by looking like he was going to kill him, had, had no intention of actually following through with the murder. He just wanted to make it look good. And with the Sword Isles being so powerful, it was easy to do. And Thomas did what he was supposed to do and just got foiled because they're badasses. What really pissed me off about that, nobody ever asked Thomas if he did it. Like we saw no camera footage or anything like that. We're just going off the word of the Sword Isles. And I mean, I'm sure he probably did. I'm sure that's part of the plot, but there was no proof and nobody ever asked Thomas. Nobody ever talked to him about it. Nobody ever questioned him. Like, why? That would be my first question. Like, bro, why did you do it? Did you do it? So when Harry comes onto the scene, the apartment building's on fire. The, fir the first fire, I think, has ever been mentioned in the Dresden Files that Harry himself did not set. But he gets there and the Sword Isles are trying to get to Maggie and Hope Carpenter. Hope is babysitting Maggie for him while he was gone. And Mouse ain't having none of that. The Sword Isles are trying to come up through the floor and Mouse is basically playing whack-a-mole with them. And it was amazing. I just never get enough of Mouse. I love that display of courage for him because while he is a temple dog, the Sword Isles are kind of written that they are more a more powerful being on the scale and the fact that mouse is like hell no y'all ain't touching her mm -mm, not today so as a result harry decides even though the apartment was not damaged by fire at all he's gonna get maggie out of there until he can figure out what's going on with thomas he takes her to the carpenters and he tells her look daddy's got to go to work and she's like are you gonna come back and he's like he just tells her the truth you know he doesn't tell her the whole deal of what he's up against, but he's very honest with her. And he lets her know, look, Maggie, I promise you I'm going to do my best to come back. But if I don't, measures are in place. He has spoken to an ectomancer. So if somebody kills him, his shade is going to be able to come back and be with Maggie. And he's going to watch over her that way. Like, 
I really appreciated that level of preparedness that Harry had for her. Man, that was just like a wizard's fatherly love moment right there. Very sweet. It wasn't corny at all. And I really appreciated the fact that Butcher had Harry tell Maggie the truth. We didn't do this whole thing where he lies to protect her and then she finds out and then she's mad at him because he lied and doesn't refuses to accept that it was for her own protection and then for the next five books they fight only to reconcile in the last one. Thank you for that. There were a few times that I literally thought Ebenezer McCoy and Harry were going to square off and duke it out. I didn't actually think it was going to happen like full blown. So when it did at the end, I wasn't ready and I was literally scared. I just knew Harry was going to kill Ebenezer. I had no idea that it was going to go the other way around that Ebenezer was going to kill Harry. Now he didn't know that he was fighting Harry's doppelganger. Of course we didn't either. And I just really didn't feel like he was that broken up about it. I was not prepared for that. And Ebenezer, like his temper is just out of control. I'll have to wonder if it's just because he was so, under so much pressure. Like he's pissed that Harry is constantly consorting with vampires. He's pissed that Harry is the winter night. He's pissed that the Formore and the freaking, a freaking Titan have allied to attack because if they attack Chicago like they threaten, then the humans are going to get involved. And it's been mentioned more than once that vanilla humans are the most terrifying of all because if they notice what's going on, that there are supernatural beings they will wipe them out. I think he had a lot on his plate and he just needed to get some frustration out. Harry just happened to be in the wrong place at the right time protecting a white court vampire. I think it was a very bad decision on Harry's part to choose that moment to tell Ebenezer that Thomas was his grandson because I think that really only made it worse. The effect that I think he thought he was going to have that Ebenezer was going to relent because they were family no, no, no. And he should have known that because he spent the whole book basically reaming Ebenezer for abandoning him as a child, his daughter, and that, that was the wrong call because there's no way in hell Ebenezer will ever accept Thomas. I think that's going to make him want to kill him more. There are some throwbacks in this one that I loved, especially when Ebenezer and Harry were fighting the outsiders. I forget what kind of hound, what they call them, corner hounds or something. And he used a spell he made for Butters' birthday and it was the Dino Serenado. I just felt like that was a nod towards Sue and I loved it. I also noticed there were a couple of mentions of Stormfront in this one too that I thought was kind of cool. Here's one I'm going to read to you and then I'm going to show you something. So what I'm reading from is when Harry and Ebenezer are fighting the corner hounds in the garage. Harry's casting a spell and he is able to see what he looks like from the corner hounds perspective. And then just for an instant, the alien thought patterns made sense. And I saw an image from their point of view, a being made of coherent light, a column of glowing energy centers and pure dread, standing like an obelisk before the corner hounds, a bolt of terrible lightning gathered around its upraised fist, head and shoulders, like a miniature storm front. I totally believe that the, the con edition of Stormfront that came out earlier this year was designed with that in mind. While I found that really cute that that passage made me think of this, once I looked at it again after reading Peace Talks, I really feel like it also is kind of a nod toward Harry being starborn. Of course, we had tons of pop culture reference in here. When Harry is having to give his passcode to get into the Sword Alf apartment building, he had to tell Austri, all your base belong to us. I chuckled so much. There's a mention of a video game about a gorilla wearing glasses. Winston, anyone? But since I mentioned Starborn, let's talk about that for a second. I have to wonder if this whole Starborn, if Harry being Starborn is why Rashid, the gatekeeper, always took an interest and Harry's actions. Like he's always been there. He's helped Harry time to time. At first when it was revealed that the gatekeeper was actually a part of helping Mab fight the gates, keeping the outsiders out. I thought that was what that whole buildup was for, for that relationship of him popping up along the line. 
But now I'm beginning to think it's because Harry was starborn and the gatekeeper was trying to maneuver him into the position of where he became the Winter Knight and allied with Mab and Molly made the Winter Lady just to solidify that connection to make sure that Harry was going to fight at the Outer Gates when the time came because he's starborn. He can hurt them. He can banish them. He's immune to them getting inside of his mind. I also got a big chuckle out of Butters with Marcy and Andy. It's like, wait a minute butters is over here having threesomes and ramirez's sex life is still nothing short of disaster on top of that then you have one of the best side characters in the whole freaking dresden files make an appearance freitas who comes on to murphy and then says she doesn't mind sharing when murphy's like looking to harry for a rescuing oh my gosh freitas was amazing she was a fantastic addition to this story way better than guard ever was as a valkyrie like guard i kept thinking that we you know when she got revealed like what she truly was and then she was and then it was kind of boring like i just really expected more out of her as a valkyrie i'm getting everything i wanted and more out of freitas um i can't wait to hear more about it but talking about murphy for a second I feel like their interactions in this book and finally getting together and saying I love you to one another, which was a very, very touching scene, it just kind of led me to believe Murphy is going to die in Battlegrounds. And then, since Miss Laura Wraith is kind of all up in Harry's Kool-Aid, I think those two are going to hook up. I don't know if it'll actually be a relationship or just a hookup. There's been sexual tension between those two since the beginning. So it's kind of like, you know what? They just need to go ahead, boink, and get it out. But I think that they're both going to feel like that's it's weird since they share a brother. I just ruined that for all of you, didn't I? You know, along with Freitas, Goodman Grave is involved, which I loved. He didn't have near enough time in this book that I wanted. So I hope we get more out of him and Battleground. You know, we've also heard so much about Harry's mother through these books. We've heard a little bit about Harry's father. I really enjoyed that Jim had a little nod to Harry's father where Harry and Ebenezer are dueling at the end and he has the ring that Molly made that had his doppelganger in it. And he kind of used the sleight of hand to do the whole, the whole bait and switch, the misdirection, which he also used again when he, Laura, and Freitas were rescuing Thomas so they could just walk out the front door. Thomas was being held in the Harry's old basement lab. And I was like, well, why didn't he just open a way for he and Thomas to escape there? Because you know it opened right out into Leah's garden before. But then I was talking to my friend Ryan about it and he was like, yeah, but that probably would have left like a magical signature and you know, people were probably looking for that, waiting on it, and it would have made him easy to find. Plus, we also needed him walking out the front door because that's when the Fomor and the Irish goddess Titan decides to show up and start wrecking faces. So he had to be there for that. I found it extremely interesting that Harry took Thomas to the island. That, you know, I thought he was just gonna take him to the island. I didn't see him actually putting Thomas in a cell, but it makes sense since he can put him in a stasis, so to say, so to speak, while they figure out how to try to heal Thomas. Ford Ives beat the absolute stuffing out of him and he was hungry. And so his hunger started feeding on Thomas himself and they can't figure out how to stop it so Harry was like you know what I'm gonna bind him in a cell on Demon Reach put him in stasis until I can figure this out but a little tidbit about that scene that's got me thinking Harry actually noticed he could not detect Demon Reach like his intellect this picks up everything else like the number of ants on the island but he noticed that he didn't pick up on Demon Reach. So I, I think that's important. I think that's gonna come into play because then Harry starts thinking, you know what? I just realized it's not like I've ever commanded him to come to me. He was just there when I needed him. So what if this is gonna tie into Merlin? And the reason why I say that is because Merlin's name was brought up. 
when Harry and company were escaping the party with Thomas, Corp, King Corb of the Fomor was reading map for filth. And he was like, yeah, well, you were conquered and cast out of the White Council by Merlin, which was like, wait, what? Mab was a wizard in the council and got cast out by Merlin and conquered by who? Like, who is this conqueror? We need to know. So that got me thinking, all the old stuff never really mentions Merlin dying, more like putting himself in stasis or exile. What if all of the cells on Demon Reach don't contain criminals? What if they contain people who are exiled or who put themselves there? What if Merlin is contained on that island and Demon Reach is kind of like a fail safe? Like Demon Reach does not ever get mastered by anyone, but he also makes sure Merlin doesn't get disturbed. I still maintain somebody, something's gonna happen and some of those people are either gonna be released or Demon Reach helps somebody escape from those cells. As he's leaving the island, he gets the spirit, Harry gets the spirit of destiny and the plaque to use like two of the most powerful artifact relics, whatever you want to call them, in the world to fight the Titan and the Fomor because they are about to annihilate Chicago that night. That's going on. Plus they find out that the outer gates are being attacked actively by the outsiders. So it's like, which one of these is the main event and which one is the distraction from the main event. Like, is it the outsiders getting in or is it the Titan? I, I really want to say I think the outsiders is the main event. Like, that is the, the goal to get them in. Whoever the mortal is helping them and like bringing the ones in that have gotten in, I wonder if that's Cal. Hmm or Justin Dumoran. I don't, I've never believed Justin was actually gone. I think he's gonna be the whole one behind the Black Council orchestrating all of that and Cal, or either Cal maybe is Justin's son or something. But I've always thought Cal was Justin. We'll find out. I guess we'll just have to wait and see because it didn't get revealed in Peace Talks like I wanted it to. Molly doesn't seem to be doing well. Molly seems to be losing herself and becoming more of the Winter Lady. Like, Harry is actively daily fighting the mantle of the Winter Knight, but I don't know that Molly is actively fighting like he is, or if she just doesn't care so much anymore. Like, something's going on with her, because he noticed she's lost a lot of weight, not really remembering to eat, so something's going on there. I don't know what. And then, most importantly, River Shoulders. Like, holy crap, Bigfoot's in the game. I think he's gonna be a major player. They are described as very, very powerful beings. He also drops the, the bomb on Harry that just, I'm gonna hope to say this right, but Janaskawa, Janaskawa? His actual name is Blood on His Soul. That's what River Shoulders calls him. So River Shoulders like, yeah, he's still alive. I thought that was kind of lazy just to say he was alive. Like that dude was a bloody pulpy mess. He was dead. We didn't get any real information as to how he could have survived. I just kind of felt that was lazy and thrown in of a, hey, I'm gonna, I wanna bring this bad guy back in the, in the second half of this book and here's how I'm gonna do it. I also think there's more to River Shoulders appearing at this time because River Shoulders has joined the Accords to be another alliance to help Harry because he's, you know, because of all the help and things that Harry has done for him and his family. But I think there's more to it because River Shoulders also mentions to Harry about being a starborn and tells Harry, anytime you want to come to me for training, let me know. And Harry's like, yeah, you know, Listens to Winds kind of mentioned that. And he said, well, I taught Listens to Winds. So Harry basically kind of didn't have time or kind of wrote off that with Listens to Winds. I think it's being introduced again by River Shoulders because it's important. Something that River Shoulders is going to teach him, whether it's to do with the Starborn or something else, that's going to tie into this fight with the Outsiders. So I really think Battleground may be more about the fight with the Titan than the Outsiders. The Outsiders is going to be a bigger fight for later 
and what Harry is going to learn from River's shoulders is going to be key in that. I think it's really important information to hang on to up yeah. there. Yeah, so that's what I have so far. I'm sure I'm going to think of something else as I absorb more. I may even try to reread this book again before Battleground because I always miss things. I always miss stuff the first time around that I catch the second time. I might have to do that, but I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of this book, even more than the book, just the conversations that I've had with my friends, you know, the nerdy narrative family that's reading it. Oh man, because the first thing I did when I finished this book yesterday, I jumped on my computer and emailed Steven about it. I'm like texting Brian, Kayla from Crack Into A Good Book. Man, the conversation just was as good as the book, if not better. I'm so glad we've only got like two months to Battleground. As far as my prediction bingo, I think of the first five chapters, I got like three or four squares, but I'm gonna wait and reveal that after I read Battleground because I combined the two books for one square since they were originally meant to be that way. So I'll check in after Battleground and we'll look at my bingo square. I don't have a bingo yet, but I do have several squares marked off. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this discussion today. Let's discuss this. Either hit me up down in the comments below or visit my Discord server. Thank you so much for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you soon.